Thanks once again for joining us. Today we introduce something we call the Tesla Semi Tug Strategy. What's going on right now is that as we transition to electric semis, there's a lot of ways we could put an optimization to the use of electric trucks in the form of Tesla that allows us to optimize the use of that vehicle. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks once again for joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're a repeat visitor, welcome back. We also want to thank our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the show, would like us to get a Tesla and therefore you don't have to bug me about it, uh, uh, please join us on Patreon as well. Comments are always appreciated, etc. So I also wanted to note that we have a piece of information we got regarding performance of the Tesla Semi under Pepsi, which is driving this show. But if you're an expert in the area and you want to input, no problema. We'd love to hear what your recommendations might be. So what I'm covering today is the fact that Tesla actually, um, the, the, so Pepsi um, has each of the uh, trucks running different routes. Today we're kind of concentrating on the heaviest trucks with the ones that are moving liquids around in the form of sodas, etc. So the people who run Tesla's trucking division that involves Tesla have made a suggestion that um, once the Tesla vehicle leaves um, its Sacramento facility, it then will do delivery routes that extend over to Reno and then the trucks um, return. So it's our impression that likelihood is that Tesla does recharge those vehicles once they arrive in Reno because we're so close to the factory at that point, it probably makes sense to go there and top off if you don't have enough power. So what we really found interesting today is sort of an update to a show we did three years ago. So what is that update? Well, it turns out there are two cases that are sort of mere reflections of how things might work for the semi as we go forward. The first idea comes from the railroad industry. So what you'll notice is that whenever you see a train going by, there's a lending process where all the railroad companies have a certain number of um, of locomotives that will pull freight. What they actually do is that they will allow other companies to use their local locomotives. And what they do is track the number of miles that their locomotives might be used by other, um, you know, like Union Pacific or any of the other railroads. And all they do is either pay the other company for the use of their locomotives or maybe swap use of their locomotives on behalf of another company. So these trains are tugging freight around and they're interchangeable, so therefore they can do this. Um, the other manner in which I was targeting the tug idea is just the fact that tugboats tend to, you know, be lined up, in some cases several of them, to move large ships once they're off the ocean to expedite speed into the port and minimizing possibility of damage. And so again, in this case, we're using that sort of analogy to suggest how we might work with the semis going forward, especially until we have scale production completed. So the case today that I particularly would like to look at is um, more than likely one of the large freight company. The top two buyers of the Tesla uh, semi thus far, or those that have put down payments in, are probably UPS and FedEx. And so I don't know if you guys have ever ridden the freeways in Colorado or some of the other places, but there are these convoys of FedEx trucks and even UPS trucks that might be moving across slowly on those major freeways. And the question is, what if you put in a Tesla Semi in the mix of that freight moving up and down sort of a large mountain range. So we're using our test case in this case 
as the range that goes from Sacramento to Reno, the length of that trip is 136 miles. So that's not a lot of miles because in theory, if it was a flat surface, those vehicles would be moving at 65 miles an hour and 136 miles, theoretically, that's just a two hour trip, you know, maybe two and a half on a flat surface. In this case, um, Donner Pass summits at 10,500 feet, I believe. And so, and the mountains in that area actually go, I think, as high as 13 or 14,000. But the way the freeway is cut, you don't have to necessarily go that high. But what I was hunting for here is the fact that um, when you drive a Tesla Semi, there are a number of things that happen. Number one, uh, you have faster elevation up those hills. Um, in theory here, we're running 55 miles an hour where trucks that don't have regenerative bra braking are running sort of in that 40 to 50 miles an hour, particularly when you're going uphill, faster when coming downhill. But they do have to be careful on the downhill side because all of a sudden you could blow out the brakes and now you have issues uh, getting the vehicle under control and damaged freight, etc. So what we were really looking for here is the fact that there is a case right now for there to be a set of semi sitting at the bottom of either side of a major mountain range. So in the United States, we have a freeway called 80 and Highway 80 goes basically from California all the way to New York. And um, it hits a number of mountain ranges in between. And so um, this is an important sort of uh, th thoroughfare because there's a lot of freight that moves along it. Now, we currently don't do this because you do have um, trucks just going point to point. It's probably quickest to do so without unhooking and then putting another uh, tractor in front of that trailer that's being hauled. But the issue that comes up is why not use a Tesla Semi to replace the tractor on the mountain? So the whole idea would be a truck from FedEx pulls up to uh, the Reno area, um, uh, drops off its tractor, grabs another trailer and goes the opposite direction again without crossing the mountain. Why don't we want it to cross the mountain? Number one, uh, regenerative braking, according to the folks, the stuff we've read from Pepsi results in sort of cutting some, something like between 50 and 75% of the costs of going up and down that mountain are eliminated because you have regenerated uh, generative braking, repowering the vehicle as it comes down the downhill side of those hills. So in essence, we have lower costs while we're operating in the mountain. Um, obviously there are problems. For example, um, a Tesla vehicle that runs 500 miles uh, on a flat surface may get half of that or two thirds of that uh, once we're in a mountain range. But nonetheless, we're saving time. That's both driver and, and equipment on the road. We're saving uh, fuel costs. Um, we're transitioning to electric. So there are costs relative to the power that goes into that truck. But um, we're also saving um, number of vehicles that get in accidents r related to uh, blow out of the brakes. So there are a number of small and incrementally um, supportive moves that make a total lot of sense here to avoid putting um, regular diesel trucks in the mountains and instead putting uh, vehicles like the Tesla Semi up there. So I wanted to encourage you, if you're interested in a Semi, a lot of folks I notice watch our shows, uh, take a look at um, there are a number of articles in different publications that have come out with Pepsi assessing what they think of the truck thus far. And pretty much all of it's been positive. Uh, drivers like it, uh, the companies like it, and particularly the environment likes it, which is one of the big initiatives that's a focal point of why they're working hard to implement these trucks. So I wanted to, uh, um, uh, kind of review all this data with you because I think that, um, yeah, it's a good idea to have gotten these trucks, 
But the question mark is, um, should we be using the few trucks that are available in a very strategic way to optimize movement consistent with um, sort of best practices here in this case? Another thing I looked up, and we'll probably do a, an exclusive show on this, is Daimler uh, is the largest competitor for Tesla when it comes to the semi. Um, I looked it up and the top uh, peak in Germany is 10,000 feet. And so that's, I would say, comparable to the top of Lake Tahoe. It may be shorter, but the absolute peak, you know, may be where the trucks have to operate for a while. If we were in California, for example, between California and Nevada. Now, I found it interesting because one of the things that's been going on is that Daimler has found it difficult to impossible to operate in the mountains of their country um, with their version of electric vehicles. So their solution has been to develop hydrogen fuel cells. And the plan is to use those fuel cell trucks until some other method of powering those vehicles could be arrived at. So I kind of bring all this up to you because um, the issue that's coming up is, guess what? They're going to be um, scale production coming out on the semi, but there are so many people that are in line trying to get their semis that this is going to result in a bottleneck. And I believe that one of the ways to address the bottleneck, but still have the most impact when the trucks are using, you know, the most diesel and polluting the most would be to have them strategically located to manage that freight over the hills. And frankly, if you had a loan policy between trucking companies like we do uh, with trains, you can even have a vehicle come off the mountain having uh, towed freight a certain distance and possibly go further simply because if all the vehicles are equipped the same way, you could simply swap out, um, you know, return the vehicle later or, or log the miles so that we know exactly what happened with uh, the usage of that vehicle just like we would have uh, with um, the, how things are managed with trains. So I uh, you know, wanted to concentrate this conversation on something I thought was useful for the semi and made sense for a lot of companies to start thinking about ahead of getting their vehicles. So again, I think we get lower costs the, uh, from a number of angles, uh, cost of fuel, um, Amount of pollution obviously is lower. Uh, we also have um, uh, sort of obvious and hidden costs. The amount of time those drivers are on the road, you know, if it's a, um, if you can go on average, you know, 55 to 60 miles an hour versus on average in the mid to late 40s, that allows you to sort of recapture um, the time on the road that you have to pay your drivers in that situation. So um, I think as we move forward, there'll be a number of ways that uh, we arrived at how to use these vehicles efficiently. And I believe this is definitely going to be one of them because uh, there are going to be all kinds of savings that weren't anticipated. And in this case, I really think that the, the battery savings will be pretty severe. And because of how efficient and well situated those trucks will be next to those mountains. I really think that um, until we have scale production in five to seven years, this is going to be a great way for people to use it. And then, you know, just put those, you know, stop with the semi, swap out truck to tractors and allow the freight to be carried on a more of a flat surface where there's not much pollution being produced because the trucks aren't working as hard. So we really look forward to your comments on this tug strategy. I think it totally makes sense. I think that uh, it makes sense for amount of pollution produced, etc. And I just think that there are a lot of people who will be thrilled to implement this and all the implications that go with it. So this is the end of our formal discussion of the semi today and the tug strategy. Let us bounce over to our health tips once again. I just finished my 25 leg lifts per leg. Did not have the five pound weight on. Also wanted to encourage you uh, not to forget small salad pride or lovemaking, uh, which facilitates 
um, uh, blood flow to your extremities and not to your stomach at those critical moments. Uh, furthermore, uh, because of some back issues for me, I've started going back to yoga on a daily basis in the morning. You know, just a few movements that are back friendly might be helpful. At any rate, once again, we want to thank you for joining us. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Chus of Wale Heathrow, Hoda Hafez, Drasiche, Nihao Ma, Kumbawa, and in Jamaica we say enough respect, Wa Good Man. Thanks for joining us, and we very much look forward to your comments. Have a great day, and bye for now.